Stressors in the home and the environment, high demands on the caregiver, and this could mean I'm kind of slipping into some of the risk factors that might be once the baby is born in the you know, older, more towards the first year of life. When there's other children in the home and the caregiving is a, big, is a big burden, we might see that as a risk factor. Poverty and associated stressors. I always like to say that because poverty in and of itself does not mean a risk factor always. It's the associated stressors a lot of times that go with that. When you've had significant separations from parents during childhood, it can put you in, some, in a challenging place to bring forward um, a relationship that's nice between you and your baby. And when there's real or perceived abandonment, we want to pay attention to how that relationship unfolds. So some of the protective factors that we think that are important to emphasize and look for and draw upon are when there's social support and when it's functional, social support that's, that su fully supports the parent as well as the child, but it's not the, the mother-in-law or the, you know, somebody who says, oh, you finally decided that you need me now and I told you you weren't going to be able to do this when they call and reach out for help. You know, I think we need to as help assess to people not only do you have social support, but is it social support that really is helpful to you? So um, when there have been supportive early childhood relationships, and one thing that I think that we can focus upon is that not only does it mean supportive early childhood relationships but from the parents, you know, the primary parents, but when there's been a special teacher, a special other person, I always talk about my Mrs. Graff, who was my best friend's mom. I still, you know, after all these years, would never call her Judy. But my mom was very sickly with heart disease and rheumatic heart disease from having rheumatic fever. And, you know, it was just for us kids, unfortunately, we just kind of waited, when's mom going to die? Because we knew that we had to learn CPR at age six, seven, and eight to help our mom that we did pump on several times and who did die young. And I, you know, I had Mrs. Graff to go to when my mom couldn't hold my banner at the softball tournament and things like that. So having somebody like that helps in a huge way to compensate. And all of our work and the wonderful work that you guys, you know, do should really appreciate building those supports and also thinking about what, what's the barriers to people utilizing those supports. So, um, what have been previous positive caregiving experiences when they've had another child that maybe wasn't challenged in the way that this child is challenged in terms of maybe excessive crying or temperament issues and, and they've, they can draw upon good experiences. That's a huge thing that can be protective. And positive experiences with adults outside of the home, as I indicated. And some of the things that I like to think about too is our own default temperament, who we are as a person. We all have a temperamental a temperament profile that looks at things like how adaptable are we? You know, what's our kind of our default way of dealing with things? Like me, I'm probably the difficult one. My mom probably was a saint for dealing with me. When I felt my emotions, I felt them bigger than life. I didn't like things to change. I was mad when Gilligan's Island had to get off right away. I didn't just go, okay, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> we got one TV show and I usually put Gilligan's Island. If she would say, supper's on, boom, and turn that TV off, I'm sure I wasn't a nice person to deal with, you know. So who we are as a person, our, our capacity for persistence, that's a, that's a big one. These are very, these are strong protective factors when you have them. And by the way, you can develop them through relationships. You know, when that's not your normal to be persistent, you can develop that through nice interactions. And having a supportive partner. So having a stable household and finances, um, being open to education. I'm sure that you guys find that when you have somebody that's like, I want to learn, tell me everything I need to know. Don't you feel like, first of all, your reaction to them is so much different than somebody who's like, can I watch Jerry Springer now? Um, <laughs> of course, I'm like back in the 80s. I guess they don't even watch, is that even on anymore? But, um, but you know, you, you respond to them differently. I was just having this big lecture with my 15-year-old stepdaughter who was being kind of mouthy with one of her teachers and she told me about it and she was like proud of herself. And I said, listen, Josie, I said, you know, when you're nice to teachers and be respectful, it, it gives you a lot of benefits. I said, take me for instance. 
Catholic school and those nuns loved me. I got to clean the convent. I got to clean the rectory. Every Monday I miss recess to count the money in the, in the rectory from Sunday. And she's like, Oh, well, that was really cool. <laughs> then we had a whole nother awareness of maybe that was, maybe they really were um, taking advantage of us, <laughs> me and Mrs. Kraft's daughter, Donna. So, but what I pointed out to her is people give you a lot more than, than uh, not when you're interactive and positive and appropriate. And I think that comes out in the way you experience life and others. And being open to education and learning gets you a lot in terms of, first of all, being able to receive the information and make good use of it. But people will help a lot more when you're in that um, frame of mind. Um, capacity to reflect on your own feelings and thoughts as well as um, the thoughts of another. And a, and a term for that is called reflective functioning that some researchers um, in the, they started talking about this more like in the 90s, Peter Fonagy and, and Arietta Slade and some others who, who talked about the fact that it's, it's a purely human capacity. It's something that no, nobody but humans can do and some of us can't do it too well is to really what Peter Fonagy says is think in the mind of another which means that I can imagine that you guys are, are done with the day and I'm probably getting you, you know, you can't wait till four o'clock. I'm just making that up. But um, maybe you are thinking that. But that you can kind of predict and think about what somebody might be thinking about, sometimes based on a gut feeling, but also based on imagining and being with somebody and being able to be in connection with another person. And what's even super cool is now we know that neuroscience validates that there is actually a process in mirror neurons, meaning that when I'm activated and attending to somebody who's distressed, the same parts in my brain and the same parts in that baby's brain are activated. So how, how cool is that? I think of that as like in the Star Trek kind of category is that we actually affect one another in this type of way. And so those are some pretty cool things. And when parents can't do that, you know, somebody might reflect that by saying, I have no idea why she keeps doing that, you know. Every time I come home, she's, um, she wanders around in the corner and she acts like she doesn't even know me. Let's say she's two years old and I have no idea why she does that. Well, what a, what a different place for a mom to be able to say, I think she's a little bit scared to get back together with me. I think she's thinking, are you going to leave? I think she's thinking you know, is mommy in a good mood or a bad mood and what do I do? I mean, it's a much better person and in fact, or much better uh, situation. And in fact, research shows us something that's really super cool again, is that it doesn't matter if the person's right. It matters that the other has the experience that I'm being thought about. So like if my mom was thinking about me and saying, oh, I think she, you know, wants to nurse or I think, in, I, I didn't want to nurse, I was just, you know, crabby <laughs> and oh I think she wants this and I think she wants that that something wonderful comes through even when they're wrong it's the it, it's the it's the same thing that you'll see in a three-year-old that just got hurt and um, falls down and turns around and says something like I'm okay mommy that reflects that somebody has been thinking about him I told I, I told this little story about my grandson um, he's um, 18 months to, this is when he was 18 months, he's almost three. So we go to um, the mall and he's running ahead of me and his mom, my daughter-in-law, and he falls down and he falls in front of this old guy that is this uh, guy that was just kind of like watching, you know, in the Lake Mall where they have all that, that stuff. It wasn't, it wasn't there, but it was like that. And he gets up and he says, I'm okay. And um, the man did not flinch and didn't even look at him. No eye contact, nothing. And he said, I'm okay. And then he turns around and we're already there. Oh, buddy, are you okay? And he goes, and he's like still looking at that man. And then he goes, what happened? <laughs> and I was like, Heather, that is like some awesome stuff. He had awareness that this is weird. <laughs> he, he expected that this guy would say, Oh, okay, buddy, you're okay. And then I have to tell you the next part of the story got even better because then he sits down with Grandma who starts giving him candy, of course. And, um, and he looked at me and he looked at Heather and he got up and he goes over to the guy and he goes, <laughs> and he comes back 
And I thought, so back, back to what that represented, I'm like, that's even more cool is that he thought there's something that I can do that can affect this man. This man must be in a place where he's having a bad day and he needs a smarty. <laughs> and I'm going to give it to him. And I thought, Heather, that's some pretty cool stuff, you know. So, you know, not to brag on my daughter-in-law, but I'm going to brag on her and my son. You know, they've done some good things. This is a kid who thought somebody's thinking about me. And when they're not, I better help them because I can help them. So.